Hi, I'm Joe. I'm an alcoholic. All of us here at White Chip hope that you've been enjoying our audiobooks and AA speakers. You are welcome to join our Facebook group. Just click the link in the description and say hello. If you support the Alcoholic Anonymous cause, please hit the like and subscribe button. We upload new AA content every day, so if you want to see more, hit the notifications button. This way, you'll be the first to know we've uploaded a new video. Without further ado, let's listen to the next AA speaker. Some people, alcoholism was causing family problems and drunk driving and all sorts of things, so they decided we need to inform the American people about know when to say when. So they searched high and low for the proper spokesperson to on television to tell us how to or how not to drink, and they found a dog. I don't know if y'all remember the dog Spuds McKenzie, but he is the official spokesperson of responsible drinking in America. Spuds, the little party animal, knows when to say when. He's a dog. He don't know what to shit, let alone what to drink. But here is our moral spokesperson of how to drink. Oh yeah, he got three women on his arms. You know, the party animal. When I had three women on my arm, it was a sin. When he does it, it's education. I mean, if you just watch TV commercials, that's why I'm afraid for our children. I mean, our children are inundated. Uh, a, a recent statistic says that when, by the time our children are 18 years old, they will have seen 100,000 beer or wine cooler commercials. But if you watch those commercials close enough, for instance, the one with Bartles and James, the two old guys. Now, Ed don't even know he's in a commercial. I mean, they've, they've set him up to be the alcoholic already. What's apparent to me in this program of Alcoholics Anonymous and the reason that we're here today and the reason that we're the lucky ones is we did one thing. We stopped drinking. We stopped the bleeding so that some repairs could be made from the inside out that we could, we could work on ourselves. We, we were given these 12 steps, but what we had to do, we had to stop drinking. Stop drinking. Stop smoking. Stop shooting dope. Stop. Not slow down, not cut back, not change brands. Stop. Now I tell this story about the difference between stop and slow down. This guy was driving through this small town and he comes to a stop sign. And he looks both ways, but he don't stop. He slows down and he goes through the stop sign. Well, a policeman pulls him over and says, your driver's license, sir. He said, for what? He said, well, you run that stop sign back here. He said, well, come on, officer. You saw me be careful, slow down, look both ways. He said, well, it's not a slow down sign. It's a stop sign. And he said, well, stop, slow down. What's the damn difference? He said, well, you, you, you don't know the difference between stop and slow down? He said, no. He said, well, come out of the car. He pulls him out of the car, grabs him by his collar, pulls out his billy club, and starts hitting him across the head. He said, now, you want me to stop? You want me to slow down? So there clearly is a difference. There's clearly a difference between stop and slow down. You know, I played for the Dallas Cowboys from 1975 to 1979. Five years. I went to three Super Bowls before I was 25 years old. I developed some real bad habits because I just didn't know how to live. I was just talking to somebody about my wife. Uh, my first wife. I've been married twice. My first wife... Married me during my worst days. You know, it was like one of those relationships where sometimes you're with a woman for five or six years, and by the time you marry them, the relationship is already over. <laughs> Somebody says that. It's kind of like an afterthought or something, you know? But she and I were sitting one night in Dallas, Texas, with two Mercedes in the garage, and she had diamonds on, and I had diamonds on, and we had Don Perignon sitting on ice and cocaine sitting on a mirror. And I said to her, honey, things are nice now, I think. We're, 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 we got it going on. We, we, we live in high and large. And I said, baby, I said, tell me, if, if I lost it all tomorrow, would you, would you still love me? 
She said, love you? She said, I'll always love you. I'll miss you. <laughs> so I kind of knew who I married. She was uh, too pretty to let go. But I became an expendable person because of my alcoholism and my behavior. See, see, my behavior began to surface. And if you're anything like me, boy, I tell you, well, please don't judge me by my actions. Please, you know I don't mean to. I mean, I always wanted to be judged on my intentions. I didn't intend to. But see, people always judge me on my actions. And I became violent fay. I was abrasive. I was threatening. I was murderous. And I was capable of shooting and killing you. I just know that cocaine and alcohol made everything go away. You know, I didn't have to think. I remember going to meet my father when I was 21 years old. And boy, it was a you know, big deal. You know, a big deal to go meet your dad when you're 21 years old. But some part of you, when you finally meet him and you get to sit back and reflect on it, you go, where has he been? And why am I all of a sudden important? And, and, and that creates, I think, a low-grade depression and shame. Because every time I introduced my father, I had to explain where he'd been, you know. This is my dad. I just met him, you know. And, and uh, we well, just met him. Yeah, I just met him. And, 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 and this is a true story. You know, sometimes I get to tell my stories and people go, geez. <laughs> I was playing for the San Francisco 49ers in 1980. I had invited my, my real father from New York to come out. Let's develop a relationship. So I gave him 2000 bucks and asked him to get an apartment in Oakland because me and my wife were standing in San Francisco. And of course, I had him set all this up because I had plans for this other apartment. So he goes and sets, gets an apartment. I bought him a brand new car. And um, I bought sheets and did all this stuff. Now, I had a grand, his father was back in New York dying on his deathbed. And I'd given him one of my Super Bowl rings. And, and I didn't give it to him. I just said, here, won't you wear this for a while? And boy, he's in the hospital with a Super Bowl ring on and just, he's dying, you know, but he just really, his last days with my, grand, my, my grandson is, is Thomas Henderson. And uh, Bill Walsh uh, came on the field one day. I'm practicing. And he uh, said, look, uh, one of those Tom Landry phone calls, he said, uh, there's a guy on the phone in here. Uh, you got a message. I think you should go take care of it. I go in and pick up the phone, call this phone number, and the guy says, I just want you to know that your father uh, just pawned your Super Bowl ring. So, <laughs> thanks, Dad. <laughs> and so, as I tried to uh, to, to find him and, be, and create this relationship, things like this were happening, you know, and that, and that don't feel good. And so, what do you do with these feelings when you don't know what to do with these feelings? What do you do with feelings if you don't even know you got feelings? You drink. <laughs> you smoke. There's no way to process it. There's no steps for you if you're not in this program. There's no way to vent this, to let this go. There's no process for a dysfunctional man, woman, boy or girl. There's no process. I feel sorry for people who are not in this program. I visit with them all the time. Tom Landry fired me in the Monday before Thanksgiving, 1979, because I was a disruptive influence, not only to the Dallas Cowboys, but to the city of Dallas. I was out of control. I was insane. I got picked up by the 49ers, uh, but they don't take kindly to you coming to work and putting on your uniform and after you've been uh, out for five days and laying on the field, you know, yawning and going to sleep. That's not part of practice. Uh, so they let me go. Then I went to treatment, got out of treatment, uh, not sober. And then I got traded to the Miami Dolphins. You know, that's a hell of a thing to be a cocaine addict and be traded to Miami. It's just not a good geographic. You know what I mean? You can, 
You know, you really want to go to North Dakota or something, you know? I broke my neck in November 1981. I'm sorry. In August 1981, I snapped the cervical vertebrae number one in my head, in my neck, on the field, in the Orange Bowl, playing against the Kansas City Chiefs, and that ended my NFL career. But I had a $175,000 salary to collect over 16 weeks. And I would go to the mailbox every Tuesday and pick up this check for 14000 or so dollars. And I had a gallon of Tangare, a lot of tonic, and a lot of cocaine, and I tried to kill myself. Within a very short period of time, when the doctors told me I couldn't play football no more, I'm not going to say that's what sprung me. I was already full out there into my drug addiction. And my, but, but alcoholism came on at the very end. You know, I found myself, after losing everything, at the liquor store like mom and dad with the bottle, with the paper bag twisted tight and getting in my car. That was 1981, 82, and 83. And I don't have to describe to alcoholics the insanity that goes on with a man who spends $14,000 a week. You can, I don't need to explain that to you. I don't like to get into too many war stories, but when you spend $14,000 a week for 16 weeks and you're doing cocaine and you're drinking and you're, and you're calling hookers and you're, and you're in cheap motels and you're... And you got a gun loaded and you're, and you're crazy and you're acting out and you, you don't know how to live, you don't know where to go, you don't know what to do. And your family don't want you and your team don't want you and the city don't want you, but the police want you. I lived in that terror place, you know, I, I came to that place where, and I'm I'm feeling it right now where, you know, you get to that place that, I want to quit this, but I don't know how. I missed everything in that treatment program. I, 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 I was lost. I didn't know nothing about no AA. I, I, I didn't hear that. I didn't hear that part. Finally, it, it, it happened in, in November 1983. I was in California and I was charged with sexual misconduct and false imprisonment. Possession of narcotics and cocaine and paraphernalia. And uh uh-oh, now all of you knew. And now it was time to check out, see. It was time to die. See, because that place in the big big book where it talks about that pitiful and incomprehensible demoralizing place. I was there. They They took snapshots of me there. I wanted to die. I didn't know how to do that. I had a brother who committed suicide because he couldn't stop smoking crack. That's when I met Chuck, Chuck Denmark. I, Chuck D. You ain't supposed to. I went to a care unit in Orange, California, and I went there because I was in trouble. That's the amazing thing about an alcoholic or anybody who's in crisis. We'll do anything to get out of trouble. We will sign up for the damnedest things when we're in trouble. Just give me some get out of trouble. So I went into treatment because I wanted out of that trouble, but I wanted all that stuff out of my head. See, that's where my danger was. It wasn't... I wanted it out of my head. But see, the world knew and the... Every newspaper in the world carried my story, and I was... You know, the only thing for me to do was just put a gun in my mouth and blow the back of my head out. Dr. Joe Persh told me, he said, Thomas, he said, suicide is a permanent solution for a temporary problem. I said, whatever that means. I checked into the care unit in Orange, California, November about the 4th or 5th of 1983. And uh, all I remember is going through detox and taking Valium. I w- showed up there. 
You know, I tell you what my last drunk was. My last drunk was getting out of jail, posting out of jail, buying a case of Coors beer, and drinking all of them as I smoked cocaine. And I remember, this was the insanity of my alcoholism. This is what I remember about my alcoholism. Throughout the night, I would put cigarettes out in cans of beer. By morning, I was out of beer. And I had this thing in my mind that I could actually drink the beer without tasting the nicotine. So I would, I would drink six or seven half cans of beer with a cigarette in it. And I, you know, whenever I think about, am I an alcoholic? <laughs> I would also have 151 rum. By the way, people, it burns. To light my swath that I lit my cocaine with. And by the end of the night, you know, that looked pretty dirty and dingy, you know, and there's about that much left in the bottle. And I would drink that. So I qualify to be here. Chuck D. took me to a meeting. He came into this hospital and he walked in and said, My name is Chuck Denmark and I'm an alcoholic and uh, I'm taking you to a meeting. And you know, and, and part of me wanted to say, Who? Hey, <laughs> I ain't going nowhere with you. I I don't know you. As if I needed to know somebody, you know. I should have been grateful that people would even speak to me. He took me to a meeting. I don't remember much about the meeting. But I do remember him telling me that I could change my life. I remember him telling me, I know you're in a lot of trouble. Because I know your head is full of... Full of you don't want to live no more and all that. Doctor told me, he said, but uh, I'll tell you what, Thomas, he, he told me a story. You know, and it had to be a miracle because I never listened to white people for nothing, see? It had to be the time for me to get this. It had to be the moment. I, I wasn't ready for this until I was ready for this. And. And, and that night I was ready. I just listened and he said, you know, you've got to get a sponsor. And I was riding over in the passenger seat and I said, well, will you be my sponsor? He said, sure, I'll be your sponsor. And that's how this new life I got started. In a car riding down the Santa Ana Freeway in Orange County. With, uh, with nothing. With no hope. No trust, no faith, no spirituality. All I had was a sponsor. <laughs> and all I had was a program. That's all I had. I have this thing that if you got somewhere else to go when you come to this room, that you'll probably go there. See, I have nowhere else to go. I'm at home in Alcoholics Anonymous. And it's the only thing I've been able to count on all my damn life. I've never been able to count on anybody, any place, ever. See, AA is that beacon, that light, that, that, uh, it's always there. You know, no matter where I go, it's there. I've been to Germany. You know, I spoke to some 2,000 Germans. I opened up with Ich bin ein großer Schwarzer Americana. Translated, that means I'm a big black American and I'm sober. It's amazing. I can speak German, but I can't speak Spanish. When I talk to a newcomer or share my story with somebody, you know, in this program of Alcoholics Anonymous, I think it's real important, it says there, that we got to share what has been our experience. And when I came into the rooms, I had nowhere else to go. And in Orange County, California, I went to three meetings a day for seven months or eight months. That's all I had to do. I had a good friend of mine in Texas who said, if you just... Do that, I'll send you a couple of hundred bucks a month. I got me a car, and my sponsor put me, he went and bought me, we went down to the Newport Club, and he went and bought me a bumper sticker, and it said, my other car is up my nose. (laughs) 
And I had a $200 car that I was making payments on. And I was behind in my payments. But that was okay because I was on a mission, a grateful mission from God. So I hung around the rooms for seven months and then finally that case came before a judge and, and I got two years in the penitentiary. And, and, and in all honesty, i got to tell you all, I went there with a program. I went there with friends and support. People bought up panels. People wrote me every day. I got 72 big books mailed to me. 92, 12, and 12. A <laughs> hundred a day at a time. And people just loved me and said, Thomas, if you'll stay sober, you'll stay free. If you'll stay sober, your life will change. And if you want a life, work those steps. Don't be afraid of therapy and counseling and aftercare. Don't be afraid to acknowledge your childhood. Don't be afraid to acknowledge any sort of abuse. Be honest. Be forthcoming. Tell it like it really is. Alcoholics Anonymous gave me a life. I spent the two years and four months in the state of California penitentiary and got out to celebrate my three-year anniversary at Hogue Hospital in Newport Beach. And I got married while I was in the penitentiary. I think it was because of the conjugal visit, but... We stayed married five years. She was in the program. And I decided sometime when I was locked up that, you know, this story needs to be told. I've got to tell this story. So I wrote a book called Out of Control, appropriately titled. I came out and I decided I need to tell as many people about this as I can, to use my celebrity to go around and talk about this. But one of the things you've got to do when you're a celebrity is that you've got to stay sober. You know, and I'm proud, I'm, I'm proud today that, that I'm sober. And... And the forecast looks good. I, I like my life. I like what I've got. That's not real incestuous. That's not selfish. I like what I got today. I prayed last year for a woman in my life. And I, my 13-year-old daughter moved in in September. <laughs> I remember my, my daughter, five years ago when I was struggling as a public speaker, I was laying on my couch in Orange County, California, smoking a cigarette, drinking coffee, watching the news. And she wanted to go to Disneyland or somewhere, and she came downstairs, and I'm laying on the couch smoking a cigarette, watching television, and with shorts on and shoes and uh, socks, and looking at the television, smoking and talking on the phone. She said, Daddy, I want to go out. Let's go out and play. Let's go do something. She was nine years old. I said, look, I said, hold on. Can't you say I'm busy? Can't you see I'm working? Now get back upstairs and we'll go somewhere later on, okay? Okay. So she went back upstairs. I got back on the phone. I was watching television, smoking, and uh, talking on the phone. She came back down. She said, Dad. I, I go, just a minute. Y yes. She says, what time do you get off? Well, her little sarcastic ass. My wife and I divorced in 1989 and I moved back to Texas. I, I, my wife and I had a disagreement. I wanted children and, moved, and wanted to move to Texas and she didn't want to do either. So we, we, we decided to get a divorce. And I moved to Texas I don't know, and I can't tell you why, you know, I can't say it was some kind of spiritual thing, but I, something moved me to go home because the only thing I remember about my hometown was the pain of my mother. So I moved back to Austin, April of 1990, to my mother who was still drinking heavily, overweight, and just pure alcoholic. And, and I got home and, and I thought I'd made a mistake. And, and the people here, some of you know that in April last year at Sonora Bay, I told you I was going to a family week. Well, Violet Faye, Miss Shoot 'em Up Annie Oakley, Went to treatment at Sierra Tucson, and uh, she's been sober now for nine months.
Uh, still dangerous, but uh, funny story. My 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 well, my stepfather. They were in a group setting, and I'm, I got my mother's permission to tell this story. They were in a group setting, and uh, he drinks and she drinks, and I'm in the room, and my sister's here, and my niece is here, and a couple of my nephews are in the room. And uh, and the, the counselor said, uh, L.C., his name is L.C., a very dark man. L.C., so when you and Violet are outside drinking under the tree, they, they talk about the tree and playing dominoes in the yard, he, and the, the therapist says, do you ever hit her? And L.C. said in the best language he knew how to muster, he said, uh, no, some, uh, she done shot several men. So... <laughs> And you know those counselors, they get that counselor not so hitting her is not an option. <laughs> I had talked to Chris and I asked Chris to lead this meeting tonight because you know, when Chris talks about being three and a half years sober and hadn't worked the steps, you know, you kind of understand. And one of the things I think that hurts sometimes in our program, as wonderful as it is, is somebody says, just don't drink and go to meetings, and people don't have any solutions in their life. And some of us need to work through some stuff. And if we do, we're lucky. I, I have a couple of things I wanted to share that, that, that are right in here. It says, it, it, they're talking about alcoholism. It engulfs all whose lives touch and suffer. This is on page 18. It brings misunderstanding, fierce resentment, financial insecurity, disgusted friends and employees, and this line, warped lives of blameless children. You know, and I'm, I was one of those children. So I, I need, you know, and I think Bill Wilson and Dr. Bob, I think all, they were all in line with do whatever you need to do to be okay. Thank you. I don't support us hanging on to anything too long, but I think it's fair to process everything. Because if not, you know, we, we, we sit around and, and, and find something else to do, you know. Like I had this thing, you know, I, I went from sugar to nicotine, you know, I've been, I haven't had a cigarette since uh, August 8th, 1988. I quit smoking cigarettes. But I had a hell of a time, you know, uh, with several things. Um, by the time I got to Texas and got my mama back, uh, now I, I work in the, in the Texas prisons. I speak at a Texas prison once a month. I talk at several programs around the country once a month. So my life is full today sharing this recovery everywhere I can. But one of the things I want to share before I end the night is, is that... Alcoholics Anonymous let me empower myself to have a life. And one of the things I do with this program is I wear it everywhere I go. I don't go into a relationship. I don't go into a business deal. I don't go on vacations. I don't go in closets or behind buildings without my program. I take this program everywhere I go. I don't take it off. It's, it's me. I, I think my program is inside of me instead of on me. Because this is all I got. I don't know how to live without this. I, so I have no memory of any other life. You know, it ain't like I can say, well, I've decided to leave this because I have some idea about that. I have no damn idea about nothing but this. Because this is the best thing I've ever had. I mean, when I get on airplanes, you know, I, I sit in the first class section. I'm big. I get upgraded because I'm a you know, million mile flyer. And hell, I get up in that big seat and the students will come by and go, Mr. Henderson, can we get you a cocktail? I have to take out. I said, nope, I, I don't drink. I'm an alcoholic and that stuff's poison. <laughs> and it seems like I always got the CEO of a company sitting next to me, smaller than me. He looks over at me and goes, okay, I'll have club soda too. <laughs>
See, Alcoholics Anonymous gave me a life. Finally. I was sharing this ring. This is a, my Super Bowl ring here, and this is a Super Bowl thing, but this right here, you know, I played in three Super Bowls, but this right here is a, uh, is a Sober Bowl ring. I, I, um, I, I was uh, I kind of was using that around the country. You know, I played in three Super Bowls, but now I'm in the Sober Bowl. And so this hospital gave me a ring. And it had all this stuff on it, my initials and Sober Bowl and November 83 on it. And I go, okay. So I took it home to a jeweler. You know, it's grandiose Hollywood. I went to put diamonds in it. You know, you got to... I really love being in this fellowship. When I first saw step one, I understood it. Step two, I identified with it. Step three, I needed to work on it. Step four and five, I was in just wonderful hands in my early recovery. I mean, you just don't know that sometimes you fall into the lap of the right people, and if you'll just pay attention, and if you'll grab on this fellowship and be lucky about it, see, because one thing I know about Alcoholics Anonymous is in order to be a part of this miracle, you've got to participate in it. There's no way for this thing to work if you don't participate in it. I was lucky early on in my recovery to fall into the lap of just... I was at the... Well, I don't know if I was in the right place or they were in the right place, but somebody was in the right place, and I think it's my higher power to put me in a position to get sober because I think that God had a plan for me. It was not to be decomposing a nice suit. It was for me to share this experience, share this recovery, pass it on. And let people know that we can become anybody we want to be in the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. It has changed my life. I actually got a chance to work 1 through 7 before I went to jail. Now, of course, in being in jail for two years or four months, you get to write a lot of those men's letters, you know? And you get, you get a few refusals back, too, you know? You can't really expect. When I did my 8th and ninth step, uh, my wife, my ex-wife, my first wife, I've been married twice. I kind of know how that is now. I had to make amends to her because I was an abusive husband. You see, when you're raised with Violet Faye and James, they fought physically. I thought that was part of a relationship. And so I abused my first wife physically. I hit her. Wrong. So when I made my long amends to her, <laughs> you know, she, she said, I don't believe that bullshit. Don't be writing me another... Don't be calling me with this abandoned stuff. I don't believe that shit. I, but I could not predict what she was going to do with it. I had to be willing to do it. I had to be willing to tell her that it was wrong. That was my part in it. I've I got to show you something. Else. Because another thing in this program, it talks about we have to trudge this road to happy destiny. And I guess you trudge it for a while. But eventually you've got to like what you got. You've got to find a way to like what you got. Get something you can have that you'd like. And, 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 and in step 10 here in the big book on page 84, it says, and, we, and this is kind of where I live today. When, when things, I, I just choose to live here. I, I try to practice these principles in all my affairs with all of my friends and all my business associations. I confront you if you need to be confronted. You confront me. I'm, I, I'm full of this stuff. I, I, it says, and we have ceased fighting anything or anyone, even alcohol, for by this time sanity will have returned. We will seldom be interested in liquor. If tempted, we recoil from it as from a hot flame. We react sanely and normally, and we find that this has happened automatically. We will see that our new attitude toward liquor has been given us without any thought or effort on our part. It just comes. This is the miracle of it. We are not fighting it, neither are we avoiding temptation. We feel as though we have been placed in a position of neutrality, safe and protected. We have not even sworn off. Instead, the problem has been removed. It does not exist for us. We are neither cocky nor are we afraid. This is our experience. This is how we react so long as we keep in fit spiritual condition. I mean, you got to get there. I just don't believe this program was designed to continue to struggle. I believe you've got to get there. And it wouldn't have said it in the big book if you want what we have. Well, if we sit with a room full of people who don't have a damn thing, somebody's got to have it. 
in order for this program to continue to be attractive. I like what I've gotten from Alcoholics Anonymous. It has changed and saved and created a wonderful life for me. I love my work. I love who I've become. I am not my mistakes. I am not my problems. I'm who, I'm who I am today. I, I'm a new human being, a new creature. I'm even a nice man. I say that to women I meet. They go, what? I say, I'm a nice man. And you know why I'm a nice man? Because Alcoholics Anonymous has let me become a nice man. I, I, all of my dreams have come true in Alcoholics Anonymous. It didn't come true in the Super Bowl. It didn't come true making million dollars. It came true having a life. It came true knowing how to live. It comes true that I'm a father to my 13-year-old daughter. It comes true that I hate boys now. I loved it when it, I'll know a new peace and a new happiness. I comprehend serenity. It's right there in the promises. So if you haven't experienced the promises, I have. I like what I've got today. If you haven't experienced the promises, keep working. Go to therapy. Go back to treatment. Go to counseling. Be a victim. Be whatever you need to be to be okay, but somehow get there. Because I think it's clear to all of us now that that just stopping drinking is not enough. I've gotten so much more out of Alcoholics Anonymous than that. I like to always tell this story about my old friend Too Tall Jones. I played for the Dallas Cowboys for for five years, and I played with a guy six nine, two hundred and seventy pounds with cold blooded defensive end named Ed Jones. But and we traveled on the road together and Ed had a snoring problem. And he had me up one night about 4 o'clock in the morning and Ed was snoring uncontrollably. And I said, Ed, you've got to turn over. And he, 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 he wouldn't turn over. And he turned over toward me and snored. He turned toward the world and snored. He laid on his face and snored in the pillow. Finally, he ended up on his back and I had to stop him from snoring. I did the only thing I knew to do. I got out of my bed and went around to his bed. I picked his head up off the pillow, his eyes opened, and I kissed him right on the lips. And I laid his head back down and went back over and got in my bed and went to sleep. I didn't have to worry about him snoring no more because he sat up in bed and watched me the rest of the night. And I am not homophobic, all right? Um, before I close tonight, I want to really thank Chris for coming up. Took a lot of courage. Give Chris a hand, y'all. He's been, he's been walking around the village being obnoxious, but he's a sweetheart. And I want to say this. I have a friend here named Wally. And there was some controversy last night, you know, and, and Wally is a friend of mine, and Wally's a nice guy. And, uh, and, and so, you know, sometimes we make mistakes and little, little judgments are very, but Wally is a nice man. So, uh, and, and the, uh, the good news about that is uh, Gail slept with a black man last night, so whatever. <laughs> anyway, Wally, you're all right. Anyway, I want to tell you that uh, Alcoholics Anonymous uh, changed my life and gave me a life. And uh, Clancy, I haven't cut the beard off, but I would like to play softball sometimes. And you know what? This man here has helped a lot of people. Give Clancy a hand, y'all. And, you know, I got to tell you, Clancy was one of the people who walked into my life when I had, you know, 13.2 days sober. You know, and, uh, and he was one of the people I looked up to early on in this process. So, you know, I mean, there are people who come and go in your life. They don't need to stay there long. All they got to do is come by and touch you sometimes. You need to grab onto the little piece of their lapel. 
Because I found it to be true. Like celebrities all over the world sometimes go out and get loaded and drunk, and then all of a sudden you see them on TV talk about AA. But sometimes I'm convinced now that sometimes it's not the messenger we should listen to. Sometimes it's simply the message. Thank you for letting me share.